Sorry. Uh, I'll figure it out. Hi, Good morning, everyone. Really warm welcome uh, to St. Peter's. Um, if you'd like to, to, to stand for our, for our first hymn, um, I'm now going to be handing over to Becky Mills, who's going to be leading our, who's going to be leading our service while I, while I preach later. Uh, so let's stand now to, to worship God with our first song. Or in prison. 
risen. In Jesus' name, Amen. And the key verse for our service today is taken from Isaiah 61. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and to release from darkness for the prisoners. So, please feel free to stand now as we continue our praise. Thank you. Worship.
individuals to see those people who need your love, provision, and peace, and for you and us to be their place of respite, support, and encouragement in their current burdens. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, granddads, dads, stepdads, foster dads, those not yet dads, and those of you who act like dads to the younger men and boys in your life. To those who cannot be with us today, we celebrate and thank you for all you are and all you will be. May you know more of the great love of our heavenly, good, good Father. In Jesus' name, we are our prayers. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Nanid. Right, let's uh, take a few moments now to think of times during the past week when we've allowed, allowed something else to get in, in the way of our relationship with God. I'll perhaps focus on one thing in particular during the course of the next few moments before we say our prayer. Let's join together now in confessing our sins. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And we can be confident that whenever we fall short, God will forgive us when we are sorry. And so, I now say our solution. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent. Have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Right, you should, um, or perhaps you have, uh, a notice sheet that you picked up from the back of the church um, on the way in. And I'd just like to draw your attention to three notices in particular. And the first one is on Saturday the 23rd of July, St Peter's is going to be having uh, a quiz, a church quiz, which I believe is unprecedented, though it uh, really has happened. Um, years back, but not in recent times. Anyway, so that's all quite exciting, um, and that's going to be lots of fun, and will give us the opportunity to both socialise and raise money for the church. And the tickets cost £5, um, if you, or whatever you can afford, and children come free, and please do invite your friends. I think it's going to be a really um, great occasion to get to know others and raise money for the church, so please do come. Unfortunately, Andrew and I are going to be away, so I, I can't be there myself. Does anyone have relevant skills or experience to help with the vision of the job centre as treasurer or secretary? If so, please uh, talk to Hugo or um, email on info at jobcommunityservices.org.uk. And if any of you have any prayer requests, um, our prayer ministry team will of course be present at the end of the service and they will be delighted to, uh, to pray with you um, at that time. Or um, you can email requests to prayer at stpetersnorberton.org.uk and we'll pray for you privately um, or in our intercessions at the front. And it's really good to know who in our community is going through difficult times so we can pray and show love in practical ways too. And as Peter says in 1 Peter 1 22, love one another deeply from the heart. And 
that gives people a great opportunity to do that. If you know that you're going through problems and difficulties, please do let us know. Okay, uh, now we're going to have the readings uh, that Kiva has chosen for this sermon. And Iris and Kenrick have very kindly offered to uh, read those for us. And the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all the Pharaoh's horses followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down upon a pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw him into confusion. He jammed the wheels of the chariots so that they had difficulty in driving. And the Egyptians said, Let's get away from this Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and the chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hands over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing the walls, waters, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of them that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. This is the word of the Lord. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. 
Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the, of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs and allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told all about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him and said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell him to Capernaus how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So many of us feel oppressed and overwhelmed to the extent we have what some people call a pandemic of mental health issues. Ours is known as the age of anxiety. And even for us who know God's liberating, loving presence, it can feel a struggle at times to resist those forces that might rob us of our peace and our joy. And you might ask, what does that have to do with this strange story about demons and drowning pigs? What I want to do this morning is to go through this story and examine its significance, the meaning of Jesus' actions as they would have been understood in the original context. And from that I want to draw some principles that I think we will find highly relevant for our lives today as we seek to know more of the liberation, more of the healing that I believe God's Spirit longs for us to experience. So firstly, thinking about the context in which this, this episode takes place, those of you who are here Last week, you might remember that Jesus has just sailed across a lake with his disciples. And there was a massive storm that, that blew up, and then Jesus said to the wind and the waves, Be still. And for any Jew who's steeped in the story of Exodus, the story of the liberation of God's people, this would have called to mind the ancient story of their rescue from Egypt. And do you remember the, the Israelites went through the Red Sea, God part, God controlled the wind and the waves, so they were able to walk through on dry ground, and then the Egyptians who were pursuing after them were covered over with the sea, as we were hearing in that reading just now. Who, who, now, who was represented, if you like, by by Pharaoh, by the Egyptian army. What we see in scriptures is often this story of Exodus was being called to mind as people were being encouraged not to be intimidated by the powers of the age over them, whether it was the Babylonians or 
whether it was the Persians, whether they were in exile and, and felt that they were being overwhelmed by foreign powers. This story of the exodus, of God's triumph over Pharaoh and his armies, was brought to mind. And perhaps today many of us will be aware of oppressive powers that hold us back from all that we could be. For some of you it might be an actual political regime where you're fearful of persecution, if not for you, then for your family. For others you might fear oppressive relationships, perhaps a, a boss at work, or perhaps a situation at home. Others of you might struggle with, with addiction or um, financial issues that constrict you, or fears, anxieties that hold you back from living a full life of joy and peace that God intends. But in the first century Israel, who was the oppressive power that held back God's people? Well, I think earlier on, going through the Gospel of Mark, it's become clear that actually the religious rulers of the day could act as an oppressive power. We see Jesus often confronting them. But there was another power that would have been all too evident if we were living today in first century Israel. And that is the power of the Roman legions, the Roman army. This occupying force who oppressed Israel, who forced them to pay taxes, and who ruthlessly put down rebellions against their power. And I think one clue we have as to, as to, as to this power being kind of represented in this story is with the name Legion that this poor man in Gerasim names himself as. The word Legion in ancient Israel, its primary meaning would have been to refer to a Roman army, an army of five, six thousand men. We know there was a legion stationed in this area of Israel at the time of Jesus. It was known as the Tenth Legion, and in fact its emblem on its standards was that of a wild boar. Pigs were used by the Romans as sacrifices in the underworld, um, were often at the time when people were being buried. Pigs in particular were sacrificed to the god of Mars, the god of war. It's possible that these pigs that we're reading about were actually being kept as sacrifices to the Roman gods. That I think part of what is going on in this story is these pigs are drowned in the sea as Jesus is demonstrating the power of God as far stronger than any power associated with the Roman Empire and with the gods of the Roman Empire. Those pigs that are hurled into the sea as Pharaoh's army was. And you might think, well, if the point of this story is partly about demonstrating Jesus' power over the overwhelming, what can seem as the overwhelming might of the Roman Imperial Empire, why isn't there a story about Jesus battling against Roman soldiers themselves? And I think part of the reason is that Jesus came to teach us that actually the real battle we face in this life is not against people, but against evil. Indeed, Jesus taught us to love people, to love even our enemies and those who persecute us. And we see him acting this out in the way he lives his life. We've looked in, in previous weeks about how he actually befriended those who collaborated with the Roman Empire, the tax collectors. Later on, we'll see how he heals a uh, centurion's servant. Jesus taught a way of loving people. 
And later on in the New Testament, St. Paul was to clarify this, this understanding. Our battle, and we do fight a battle, is not against flesh and blood, Paul writes in Ephesians 5, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We do fight battles in this world. As we've discussed in previous weeks, that's one of the reasons why evil and suffering sometimes appear to triumph in this world, because we are engaged in a spiritual battle. And our call is to resist evil and through the way of love to champion the liberation, the freedom from oppression that God's Spirit longs to bring. But of course this is not only a power encounter that we see in this story. It's also a power, a story of healing. And I want to spend some time now thinking about this man from Gerasene. His first words to Jesus, in the name of God, don't torture me. I do wonder if this implies that he himself, perhaps, had been tortured by the Romans. We know from historians that apparently that area was quite rebellious against Roman imperial rule, that there were times when rebellions were put down. Perhaps he had been tortured. And we know that sometimes the effects of those who, who, who the effects on those who suffer from abuse and from trauma are that it can make them what we call hypervigilant, hyper-fearful of what others will do to them. Perhaps that's what we're saying here. He's fearful that Jesus will torture him because he suffered torture and abuse himself. But so often our previous relationships can affect the way we view God and indeed the way we relate to others. We're told that this man in, in verse 2 lived among the tombs. Perhaps he found it difficult to relate to people, to trust people. Maybe he chose to live in isolation from others. Or maybe that was also a place in which he mourned. Maybe friends of his who had been killed by the Roman Empire. And we're told in verse 5 that he would cut himself with stones. You can see it in that picture, the marks on his arms. I'm told that so often self-harm can be a way both of coping with emotional distress, but also of trying to, to feel in control. Like many victims of abuse, perhaps this man felt a sense of powerlessness. And perhaps that might be why when the demons are thrown out of him into this herd of pigs and the, and the pigs are drowned in the sea, demonstrating Jesus' power over the evil powers. Maybe that was part of the reason that enabled him, by the, once he had seen that, to be sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, in verse 15. And then we're told that he goes on to, to praise God, to tell others about what Jesus has done and how amazed that they are. And I think one of the things that we see kind of going on in this story is actually Jesus showing through a real life example with a real person what Isaiah 61 meant. Do you remember Isaiah 61? Um, that beautiful passage that we're told in, in particularly Luke's Gospel at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he had declared as a kind of manifesto, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And he went on, he sent me to bind up the broken heart and to proclaim freedom for the captives. I think that's part of what we're seeing in this story, the liberation of one who was bound by chains because people were so fearful of the harm he would do. 
to proclaim the day of vengeance of our, of our God. See in that last sentence, another way of, of, of translating that, that might be the administration of justice. And there's partly that triumph, that binding of evil, that, that showing of, of Jesus as high above every power that's implied by that day of, of vengeance, that day of judgment. And that passage in Isaiah 61 goes on to talk of the God who comforts those who mourn, who gives crowns of beauty instead of ashes, garments of praise instead of a spirit of, of despair. I do wonder whether there's something very significant about the detail that, that Mark includes in this story of of this man at the end, the man from Gerasim. I told he was dressed in his right mind. He goes on to, to praise. He is rescued from a place of despair. And he's clothed not only physically, but that sense of powerlessness, of lack of hope being exchanged for a garment of praise. So what application for us then can we draw from this story of God's sovereign power, his triumph over the spiritual forces of evil, but also the story of his healing love? I think the first point I would want to draw from this is do not be intimidated by the powers of this age. That instruction that Moses gave just before the parting of the Red Sea to the Israelites as they were frightened of Pharaoh and his army was, do not be afraid, stand firm. I'm told by someone who's counted these things up, the most frequent command in all of Scripture is, do not fear. And modern science, it seems, is beginning to uncover more about why fear is so bad for us. I understand this hormone called cortisol, this stress hormone, is released in us when we're fearful. It can cause all sorts of problems with our physical health, but it can also often can it affect the way that, that we think, making it harder for us to make balanced judgments, for us making it pushing us all too easily into that fight or flight syndrome, seeing people as a, as a threat uh, to which we need to either respond aggressively to or to flee away from. How do we resist being fearful? Well, I think so often part of the key is to pause, to be still, not to react in the moment, in that instance. I think perhaps God's word to so many in this generation is be still and know that I am God. That wonderful psalm, Psalm 46. This is part of the way we resist fear. And instead of fearing what this world fears, instead of fearing the powers that can so often hold us back from what God's called us to, be a people instead who put our hope in the sovereign and eternal power of God. Because although we will face battles in this life, we know that God's reign and rule will outlast any other power. We might end up with very little treasure in this world. But if we follow Jesus, he promises us that we will be storing up a treasure in heaven. That's why it makes so much more sense to care not about what we find in this world, but on what we have waiting for us in the next. I want to tell a, a story that, that gives a sense of the strength we can draw from where we put our, our hope. It's a, a story about uh, an orphanage, and it was run by um, 
a very unpleasant lady who liked to have people in fear of her. And she noticed as she ruled over this orphanage that there was this one girl in particular who just seemed to have spirit, who seemed to be cheerful, who, who didn't seem intimidated or fearful by her. And this annoyed this lady, and she tried to find out more about this girl. Why was it that this girl wasn't intimidated by her? And she asked around and through those who knew this girl, and she realized that this girl held this belief, this belief that she wasn't actually an orphan, but that she had a loving and, and wealthy father who, for whatever reason, couldn't take care of her right now, but would one day come to the orphanage and take her away with him. That there would be some very good reason as to why he had allowed her to live in this orphanage, but soon the orphanage would be a distant memory. She would find her true home with her true father who would provide for her. And when this lady in charge of the orphanage heard this story, she dreamed up an awful scheme. She asked a friend of hers to come and dress up as a wealthy merchant. And she invited the wealthy merchant, her friend, to come into her study. And then she sent for this girl and said, your father has come. And this girl, excited, came in to the office. And this man who was dressed up pretending to be her father explained that he had no interest in her daughter, in his daughter, that he disowned her and he said, you will stay here, I'm not going to take you away. Apparently that girl left her spirit, was broken. Apparently she caught a, a, a disease soon after that. And the person who led that orphanage got her wish, this person was unable anymore to have that strength to resist the fear and fight it against her. And the reason that I tell that story is to show the power it can have when we have hope, when we know where our true indestructible home is. And we have a hope that's based not on wishful thinking. Thankfully we have a hope that's based not on a lie of someone evil, but we have a hope that's based on the living God himself. When we put our hope in the sovereign and eternal power of God, that is where we can find the strength to recognize that these things that can make us fearful and intimidate us only have a temporary power over us. One day we will be free. One day we will come to our true home. One day we will truly be able to live in the light of what really matters. And my third point is to do with praise. It's how we see the story ending of the man from Gerasim. We're told he's telling other people about what Jesus has done for us. Something that's so powerful about expressing with our, our lips, with our words, with telling others what has happened in our life. You might like to, to try it later. If God has, has done something for you recently, telling someone else about it, whether they're a believer or, or not a believer. Most people actually love to hear stories about our own experience with God, our own stories. Try telling them about it. Often it can be a key to, to, um, to enabling us to more fully apprehend and appreciate what God has done. And praising God, of course, it's also something we do with our lips, with our songs. It's one of the reasons why we love to sing praises in this church. It's one of the things we'll be doing after this sermon. So, in conclusion... Let's remember this story of Jesus' triumph over the powers. A triumph that brings liberation 
and healing. Don't be intimidated. Resist the pressure to conform to the fears and anxieties of this age. Instead, let's put our hope in the sovereign God whose power will outlast any other power. And let's praise his name with our songs and with our speech as we face our fears today. Should we stand to worship the living God?
uh, that Christ bought us for, that we might know the freedom of the children of God. So, Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living Word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, who took flesh as your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin. He lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross, and put an end to death by dying for us, and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. And so he fulfilled your will, and won for you a holy people. So therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and your glorious name, forever praising you, and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave me thanks. And he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he gave you thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. And, Christ is risen. and so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and his glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. Now, as we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup. And we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people. Gather together into one in your kingdom, all who share this one bread and this one cup, so that we may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in the whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty God, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Forgive us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. And though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. So draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith. With thanksgiving. Could I ask um, Anna and Geraldine and Becky if they were able to come and help distribute?
communion now. People are welcome from any Christian denomination, anyone who knows and loves. The Lord Jesus is welcome uh, before his table now. And, um, and if children are, are welcome, but only with their parents, um, with their parents' permission. And, um, right. um, Mandy, would you be happy to, to help distribute some, you know, Geraldine's with the, the children? So, in the minute if you come to the front, we'll be distributing bread as people line up. And then if you'd like the option of having some wine, um, no pressure, I know for health reasons, some of you would prefer not to, we'll, we'll have non-alcoholic wine on, on this side of the church and normal wine on the other side of the church. So do feel free to come up and have some wine after you've taken the bread.
Lord God, we thank you for these gifts that have been so generously given as part of our worship. And we pray that they'll be used to bring light to those who are in the darkness. In Jesus' name, Amen. Right, so we're coming towards the end of our service now. And um, let's have a final blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. So as Mandy mentioned in her intercessions earlier on, it's Father's Day today and we've got a special gift for everyone here. Um, who's male? Um, father or not. Uh, and so we'll be distributing those shortly. But before we do that, I've got a special announcement to make. And it's Anna's birthday today. So let's all sing happy birthday to Anna. Where's Anna?